Hi everyone, welcome to this short broadcast on a common theme at the moment, which uh, a lot of people have as they watch Tesla and Bitcoin, and we'll talk about other things beyond those two anyway. And that common theme is, hang on, my neighbor's making millions from stocks. What's going on? And uh, it's something which came up in a conversation with my wife. One of my students had uh, explained how he'd made so much in XYZ company. And my wife said, how come, how come I, I can't do that. Tell me how, tell me how, teach me how. And I explained the risks involved as well. So let's look at that. At, le at least I'll give you an education of what's going on in the markets in the world and the risks associated with some of the returns that you might see. And it'll give you, hopefully, a sense of peace and calm. Uh, whether you're in it or not, and make you decide if you do want to be part of that level of risk taking, which people are doing. So first things first, I'll explain a little bit about why you shouldn't be jealous anyway, on the returns that some of the people have made, uh, and what it is they're doing to get them and what you can do about it. Okay, so let's look at some of the returns. Well, this is uh, a bunch of US equities, 4,000% return, anyone? And I actually had to look this up, what 4,000% means. It means $1,000 becomes $40,000 in profit, okay? We're used to dealing with 100% return, but 4,000? And if you look at this, these are just, as I said, US. We'll come to UK in a second. We're looking for patterns. Can we see any patterns in the data between the ones which did well whether it is in terms of returns, let me just highlight that for you, whether it is in terms of the returns they made last year. Okay, and by the way, Tesla, it's over here, it's number 25 in the list, doesn't even make our top 10. Okay, oh, how come we don't hear about it then so much, Alpesh? Well, you need a charismatic CEO probably to hear about a lot of these companies. So that's where we are with that. Is there a correlation with subsectors? And very important, in analysis, actually in, su in success in life generally, something called disconfirmation bias. Those which seek disconfirmation of the hypothesis they might hold tend to be richer. It's not me who said it, George Soros actually said it. If you look for disconfirmation of your pre-existing beliefs, you're more likely to collect more evidence, relevant evidence, and not fall into the trap, the bubble trap of only listening to things which suit your own pre-existing biases and your pre-existing uh, 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 views, okay? So good science, good data analysis, and this is science, involves looking at things, well, wait a minute, is there anything which, which these companies have in common with the losing companies? So for instance, you might think, oh, but you've got to go to biotechnology. Put it in a simple way. Well, no, what if I told you some biotechnology companies went bust last year as well? That's what I mean by disconfirmation bias. So are there any patterns, not just in terms of the winners, but things which they don't have in common with the losers? Okay, the ones which drop 90% or more. For instance, the companies which went up the preceding year in 2019, well, some of the winners in 2020 went up the year before, some went down the year before. So we can't say, oh, it's the ones which lost the most the year before. They're going to rise up the most, i.e. bottom fishing. That wasn't a strategy in and of itself. Some went up, some went down. So we know that's not the case. What about the level at which their prices were? We know companies which tend to have smaller absolute numbers in their stock price tend to reflect companies which have also got smaller market capitalizations. For instance, it's a lot easier for a company to go from $2 to $20. It's also very easy for a company to go from $2 to bust. It's also easy for, easier for a company to go from 20 million market capitalization, its value, to 200 million, far easier than it is for a company to go from 2 billion to 20 billion. Now there's data to support that, but that in and of itself, whilst it might be a sufficient condition, it's not a necessary condition for success. Otherwise, we'd just have a very simple strategy and we'd all be rich. Equally, some of those companies, like I said, appear in the losing uh, list as well. So we can't just use the simplicity of uh, as such a strategy. We know it's going to be multi-factor. This, in a way, is showing you the scientific approach uh, to trying to find, through data mining and data analytics, trying to find uh, winners against losers and how it's done. So I want to give you an insight into what it is hedge funds do, for instance. Okay. The other question, therefore, ultimately is, is it replicable? Can we find companies like this Ag Eagle uh, or Silver Eagle, God knows, um, Ag Eagle Aerial Systems, which went from next to nothing to being up tenfold? It's a 10-bagger 
uh, well, the bigger problem becomes one of psychology as well. Imagine it goes down 50%. Would you still have held on to it? So you can see the psychological problem. What if it then shot up, tripled your money? Would you have stayed in if it then pulled back? Okay, so again, a psychological issue, something drops, would you stay in something shoots up, would you have stayed in, it then drops back after going up, would you have stayed in three problems right there, right, and goes flat for prolonged periods of time, would you have stayed in, fourth problem of psychology, which is why a lot of people will be kicking themselves they didn't stay into Bitcoin or Tesla. The fault's not theirs, it's human psychology. Tesla pulled back 50%, would you have stayed in? It went sideways for a long time, would you have stayed in? It bumped up. Would you have stayed in or exited then? And then it pulled back. Would you have stayed? So you can see why many people don't stay in the 10 packers. Is there a strategy we can use to avoid those psychological problems or at least mitigate them? Okay, at least mitigate them. So we're less like the guy at the casino who's just throwing the dice and saying, oh, I'm just going to throw some darts at a number of stocks. Hopefully one of them will be the next Tesla. Okay, how do we avoid that? So we, we reduce the number of losers and get closer to those which are more likely to win. And what do the losers look like? Well, let's share some of that. This is what the losers look like. Look at that, 95%, 90%. When I used to write my Financial Times column, Okay, I wrote a column uh, about how if a stock drops 90%, most people would agree it's probably easy enough for it to drop to 95% down. Well, did you know if a stock drops 90%, it has it loses 50% before it goes down to 95% loss. Yeah, most people don't realize that. They think the difference between 90% and 95% is 5%. Play with the numbers. Okay, if something drops 90% and then halves again, that means it's lost uh, 95%. Put another way, if something was at 100p and went down to 10p, if it then went down from 10p to 5p, it would have gone from 100 to 5p. That's a 95% loss. The difference between 90 and 95% loss is you losing 50% of your money. In other words, just because something's dropped 90% doesn't mean those are the ones you should buy into because next year they'll go up. And our data again doesn't suggest that bottom fishing is sensible. And it also suggests there's a lot of commonality between the ones which have dropped 90%, here's a risk warning for you, than the ones which have risen because you might say, oh, no, no, we just want to be in software companies. Well, look, software companies can drop, biotech companies can drop, okay? Pharmaceutical companies can drop, right? So it can't be as simple as, oh, we'll just pick the ones with the biggest losses, the ones which went up last year or the ones which went down last year or the ones in certain sectors. As I said, it's going to be multi-factor. So what does our research suggest when you're looking for extremities, i.e. 10 baggers, not just the middle ground, which most of us are looking for, which is just, you know, 10% return or 20% or 30 or 40% return in a year. The middle ground, we're talking 10 baggers, life-changing amounts of money. What do they then have in common? Is there something there we can look for? Is there's something we can find. Now, there are, for instance, UK companies which are up over 300% in the last 12 months. But the risk is, what about the which ones which went bust, which had common factors, and how do we replicate? So I just want to share with you, let's say, Novacid. Okay, never heard of it before, went up 7,000%. If I had a time machine, I would have gone back and bought into it. Or there's all active asset. The only one in this list we picked on our middle ground, i.e., our sensible way of picking stocks, which is based on cash flow, revenue, growth, and earnings. And listen to what I just said. There was only one last year, which was on this 10 bagger list. Well, there's only one we picked. There might have been more on it, which was on this 10 bagger list. And it was a company called Best of the Best, which went up, you know, several hundred percent. There you go, 500 percent. But that is not replicable for finding 10 baggers because that was a company which not only went up tenfold, but also happened to have good, strong cash flow. What we found is most of these companies have negative cash flow. They have negative sales growth. They have, they have loss making, okay? Which is why they jumped up so much, but it's also the characteristics they share with companies which go bust. In other words, they really are of the types of companies which are looking for gold and happen to find it or oil and happen to find it. Right, uh, those are same. They're, they're exactly the same as companies which look for oil and don't find it and go bust. So again, can we differentiate? Is there some way, maybe using clever people, using artificial intelligence and a bit of Bayesian logic to find? Are there commonalities? Is there some pattern recognition in this that we can find in terms of valuation, growth, income, cash flow? Well, like I said, the characteristics they tend to have are the ones 
which are problematic. So whilst we take a best of the best, which went up 500% in 12 months, look at the problems we had to avoid. What about the fact when it dropped or went sideways for a long period of time and then eased back? How are we going to avoid some of these psychological issues as well? So the solution could be, because you might have sold early and not got the 10 bagger and, and sold it early, looked in the rear view mirror and found, oh my God, it kept on going up. One solution might be, well, if it goes up 100%, take out your original capital. But the problem with that becomes you're then using less capital for it to rise. And you might say, well, I don't mind. I'm getting big returns. Well, big returns do justify, uh, 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 are justified only if, only if you can mitigate the risk and you need the bigger return to justify the risk you're taking in the stocks you have. So you might not want to take out your original capital, though I think it's a sensible thing to do. Your alternative, you could say, well, I'll wait 12 months. I will not look at it beyond that period because I know psychologically I may well take it out too early. But again, that presents a different problem, which is, well, what if it rises then falls back and you wish you had looked at it sooner? But again, I'd probably say on balance, holding for 12 months is probably better than constantly, and then reviewing, than constantly looking at it uh, to avoid that psychological problem many had otherwise. How do you find it anyway? Like I said, it might be bust, so we'll look at that in the next slide. And surely anything that can go up 7,000% can fall 100%, i.e. lose all your money? Yes. And surely if you, have a lot, if you have to kiss a lot of frogs to find these because it's not certain that there's one strategy which works, then surely you risk losing lots of money. Okay, so how might we, again, mitigate some of these things? What can we do? Well, first of all, you've got to ask yourself, are you willing to lose 100% of your money? Most of you wouldn't be, and you're right not to please switch off now. The best assumptions you can make is this. We should only ever use risk capital. Make sure you're stupidly rich. And this is just speculation. Apologies for spelling speculation wrong. Uh, whenever I read the word speculation, it, I sort of get shivers. Divide into 10 equal lots, maybe your capital, so you can kiss more than one frog. But that means you've got to have more capital, okay? The stock price will probably be between, in the UK market, 10p to 50p. And you saw in the US market where the relative stock prices were. They were probably around the $10 mark. Okay, why? Because those numbers tend to be part of 10 baggers, also part of companies which go bust. So this is only one factor of several we'll have to uh, put down as a necessary, not a sufficient condition for success. Uh, put another way, elephants don't dance. Those big companies worth billions, tend not to, Tesla's an exception, and the exceptions are few, tend to go up tenfold, a hundredfold in value. It tends to be the smaller companies which do. The market cap will probably be under 100 million. They'll be on aim, high risk, alerts, mm -hmm, uh, you know, sirens. They may or may not have risen in the past 12 months. We could not find evidence that there's a correlation between what's risen in the 12 months preceding a 10 bagger and what hasn't. They may or may not have risen in the past 12 months. They will be burning cash. They will be making losses. Best of the best was an exception, was an outlier. Okay, that's part of our more normal middle of the road strategy. You can see why more people want middle of the road strategy. And by the time I finished explaining this to my wife, she said, hmm, maybe we stick to what we're doing. Okay, uh, price momentum was already picking up. Now, this is something which the winners have in common. The price momentum is picking up. So we're going to continue with the research on this. We've started the research. I first started uh, investing in the 10 baggers when I was a student and stopped when I was a student because as I got older and more sensible and wanted to set up an asset management company, I had to be more responsible. But I thought to myself, well, actually, well, because I've had quite a few calls and emails from people. I thought, well, let's have a look at this for those who are interested from an educational perspective, okay, from an educational perspective on what we do. Let me just go back to the uh, uh, normal scenario and say, well, I'm going to share some of the research as we go through it to look for patterns in the winners differentiated from the losers, ones which have price momentum picking up, which seem to be a, a critical factor, some cash flow, not lots, but not, not the ones which are burning too much cash, but do have some cash burn, okay? Uh, and that seemed to be a, a, an important factor as well. Those which were burning too much, we're going to run out and more likely to go bust than those who were burning a little. We'll look at other factors as well in terms of working capital in the bank and, and, and so on to see what we can find. If you want to follow my research and it's going to be freely available, it's on my Telegram channel. That's what it is. It's completely free. Uh, I'll probably post the first bit up in the next, some point within the next 72 hours 
okay uh, uh in terms of the names we find in this it's purely educational do not go off and think you're going to become a, a gazillionaire as a result but it's to give you an insight into how we use patterns in data and data mining and how we use the scientific approach of what does this have in common with winners and what doesn't it have in common with losers and what factors seem to be important knowing also we'll never get certainty that if you do this, it is certain to go up. If you do this, it's certain to go down. Many of you will be watching the broadcast on the vaccine and things like that. Well, there's a lot of similarity in the scientific approach there. There isn't a certain 100% of a vaccine. There's a lot of different outcomes, even though the same people get the same data and so on and so forth, i.e. the same injection. The outcomes can vary depending on the specimen we're looking at and the time we're looking at and the uh, external factors. And this is all very much to do with how data mining and uh, works when it comes to stocks. There isn't the certainty, but we're trying to fish in a smaller pool. So we're more likely to be successful rather than just in what might be the control group where we just throw darts at a dartboard. And that we will have to use a control group. We'll have to say, well, we just randomly pick these. Did we do better than the control group as well as getting a positive return, as well as doing better than an index? All of those factors are important. After all, we're chasing 10 baggers, life-changing amounts of return, tenfold return. Okay. And the other factor psychologically you have to remember as I scroll backwards through the slides is this. Most people in isolation think, oh, I'm willing to take that risk. But when within a month they're down 50%, they realize they weren't. Okay. So our theoretical belief of the risk we're willing to take is far greater than our actual, actual risk appetite. Right. So like I said, all of this is not for people who uh, uh, think, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm willing to take it. Oh, it's my life savings. That's just my pension bot. Let's put it in. It's more to give you an education of why you shouldn't be feeling FOMO. It's much, as, as much a psychological uh, experiment that is a, as, as a real one, but also to give you an insight into how the extremes of investing are done. And it's not how hedge funds would ever uh, invest. They would not speculate the way I'm about to tell you because it is too risky and they would never get investors because most of our investors are hedge funds and family offices who want to conserve their wealth uh, rather than people who are speculating, which tends to be private investors. So this is why it's good for education because it'll teach you a bit more about financial education and teach your children as well, I hope, because they will be seduced by this through you know internet adverts into thinking that, oh, Tesla went up this much, let's throw the dice, and which is what they're uh, usually doing. So I'll share that research as we go through with it on the Telegram channel or go to alpishpatel.com. Okay, as well. And you'll find it on there as we go through the experiment and why you shouldn't be envious or jealous of those making those returns. Maybe they just got lucky and they can't replicate it. And when they try and replicate it again, they'll lose a bit like the guy who goes to the casino, puts it on red, makes his money. Does he ever walk out? Does he ever leave and say, I'll never bet again? No, of course not. Goes back and has a strategy which doesn't replicate and therefore loses that money eventually anyway, if that makes you feel better. Uh, so <laughs> well, I wanted to share it either way. That's it for now. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. I will share that research in future calls and on, like I said, sign up on alpha.com to my Telegram channel as well. You'll find it there as well. I hope you find it useful. Thank you.